this uh, juncture, it is time for public comment. And uh, as I noted before, if you've aggregated time with council, then council will get up to 20 minutes to speak. Otherwise, we're going to be limited to two minutes. So uh, it is the intention to go to about 6 o'clock, and then we'll uh, uh, make a, we'll continue the hearing. So uh, at this point, I would ask uh, Mr. Sinney to speak, please. And Michael uh, will clarify some detail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to clarify, Attorney Senny is representing a number of his clients in the Borndale area who have ceded their time to him to be able to speak for that duration. Just to clarify for those members, I'm going to read off the list of the clients that are on the list that Mr. Senny rendered to me, just so you know that if your name also appears on our sign-up sheet to speak, you will not be called upon that you've ceded your time to Mr. Senny. The names I have are Karen Runyon, Don McPhee, Gail McPhee, Kiana Ozar, Mark Hebb, Sue Hebb, Melanie Curran, Josh Curran, Lydia Manter, Dave DeSisto, Dottie DeSisto, Ray Burke, Barbara Nagel, Walter Nagel, and Peggy Burke. Before you begin, I need to back up again. Uh, there have been some people that signed up to speak that were perhaps not here when uh, we had the swearing in. So I would ask uh, you all to stand, please, if you came in late. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Members of the uh, Cape Cod Commission, our Executive Director of the Council, and uh, staff members of the Commission. My name is Christopher Senny. I don't live here on the Cape. I live in... Oh, I'm sorry. I live in Westboro, Massachusetts, which is about an hour and 15 minutes north west of here. I am an attorney. I have a small land use practice in my hometown. I'm accompanied today by, by my daughter, Kate Senny, who works at my office. And Kate, uh, during the break, has uh, placed on a number of your seats a booklet that I would like to take the commission through uh, during the few minutes that uh, I'm able to speak. I thank my clients for ceding their time to me. I understand I'm limited to 20 minutes, even though we read uh, a list that was a little longer than, than 10 individuals. I appreciate the chance to speak for that long. Um, as I mentioned, uh, during the break, I passed out a, a booklet of material which I would like to take you through. Uh, more than half of the pages are pictures, and it doesn't take as long uh, to go through this as it might appear uh, when you first take a look at it. Uh, do, does every member of the commission uh, have a copy of the booklet I, I placed? Or is there anyone who, who doesn't have a copy? All right, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to just go through the booklet as quickly as I can. Uh, I represent uh, the clients who are listed on the fourth page of the cover letter. You can skip the, the letter itself. Actually, page five lists the clients I represent and their addresses. They all live in the immediate vicinity uh, to the new generation wind uh, property. Uh, the next page is a, uh, a photograph of a model, and I've actually placed the original of that model on the table in, fr in the front of the room. Uh, that's a, uh, a wind turbine uh, that uh, related to the house in front of it would be in scale. So that plastic house would be a normal two-story home, and the turbine next to it, which is a Vestas model, which is not important in this case, uh, that's a turbine that is the uh, equivalent size compared to that uh, home of the Nordics uh, N100, the 2.5 megawatt turbine. The turbine at its total height when the blade is at the uppermost position is 490 feet 
uh, above the ground. The second page is another picture uh, of the model that I've presented. Uh, at this moment, I'm at a podium in another town speaking about uh, wind turbines. The, the next page has three photographs on it. It represents the size of uh, component parts of modern wind turbines. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, uh, the blades that would be brought to this location are as large as the blades that you see on this truck. So these are very large pieces of equipment. The next page is uh, a plan you've already seen today. I wasn't sure that there would be PowerPoint presentations, so I, I supplied a, a copy of the plan where the four turbines are proposed. You can see the four turbines in red circles. You can see the outline of the property in yellow, and you can see the neighborhood uh, to the southwest, which is uh, where most of my clients live and where I have the greatest concern about the impact of these turbines. Uh, if you turn to the next page, you'll see that I've zoomed in a little bit on that plan. You'll see that the distance between Turbine 5 and the Borndale Elementary School is noted as 943 feet, and the distance from that turbine to the closest residence is 1,328 feet. On the next page is a photo simulation prepared by the applicant showing turbine number five in relationship to the school. On the next page, I, I show you two pictures of turbines, large turbines. And on the left, you see a page from the GE uh, brochure for a 2.5 megawatt turbine. And on the right, you see a photo simulation in Bourne of the, uh, the kind of turbines that we're talking about in relationship to homes. And what you'll notice is that the companies that make these turbines when they print their brochures, every single photo in their brochures has no houses in it because these machines are not really meant to be uh, neighbors to residential communities. The next page it has a lot of typing on it and a paragraph in the middle that's uh, highlighted in yellow. It's page three of the DRI application before your commission. And I'll read the quote. An extensive feasibility study that balance the need for clean renewable energy production with environmental and community impacts, determined that seven wind turbines could be sited on the property, maintaining appropriate setbacks to property lines and residential abutters, and minimizing the impact on the environment and surrounding area. This paragraph from the application is really the benefits and detriments test. It has everything right here. We're looking at the uh, the benefits of clean renewable energy production and the impacts on the environment and the community. And this talks about an extensive feasibility study. And so really, if we could look at that study, we would, we would have a guide to how the subcommittee did in balancing the benefits and the detriments. The problem is that that feasibility study is not in the record because the applicant refuses to make it available. If you turn the page, you'll see a letter from source one, which either still is or was a consultant to the applicant. And at the bottom, there are some highlighted sentences which read, with regard to the feasibility analysis referenced in Attorney Senny's letter, the study contains sensitive information. Even the wind resource data is sensitive in nature and has commercial value and cannot be publicly released without possible financial detriment. Now, this is the study that would back up a claimed 29% capacity factor. That's a very high capacity factor. The claim is that these turbines will produce quite well, but the record has only the bald assertion that it will achieve a 29% capacity factor. And without the feasibility study, we don't know that that's for sure. The feasibility study has the profile of the wind here, the wind speeds, and without that information, we just can't determine the claimed benefit. In addition, the profile is critically important to understanding whether or not these turbines will create a distressing kind of sound pressure that could travel far enough to reach into the neighborhoods where my clients live. There's another incompleteness to the application, and I think the subcommittee was really focused on this when it made its decision. The next page is page 10 of the DRI application, and I quote, the project will soon have more information about current electrical demand for the Cape Cod region, ISO New England is in the process of initiating a system impact study, which will likely be approved this week. 
The study will cost approximately $70,000 and will take several months to complete. The study will focus on the impact of connecting the new generation wind project to the grid by analyzing demand with and without the turbines. The applicant will provide the results of the study as soon as they are available. There is no uh, connectivity study. We don't know if the grid can handle 9.5 megawatts of electricity at this location. And an application for this size turbine, which really is a power plant, shouldn't be brought forward until that study is part of the record. On the next page, you'll see the, uh, the property and four of the original seven turbines. You'll see six buildings in the middle. This is a plan that the applicant has uh, prepared for what they call a green technology park. It has six buildings uh, which are laid out in a very nice uh, arrangement. They would be very valuable buildings. I support the idea of this industrial park, especially as a green industrial park. If you turn to the next page, you'll see an up-close view of an area that I had an engineer shade. That's an area of land that could accommodate solar array panels that would generate as much electricity as the four remaining turbines, nine and a half megawatts of electricity. On that plan, which is part of the record before the commission, I included the notes on the solar alternative. I'll just read note number one. A 9.5 megawatt solar array fits easily on the site while leaving sufficient area for the planned green technology park. On the next page, you'll see the value of the end goal of the developers, this great technology park, this industrial park. It would provide 475,000 square feet of finished area with a total value of about $70 million and about a half a million dollars of taxes for Bourne. So the idea that this property is rendered valueless if this uh, commission does not reject the recommended uh, resolution of the subcommittee is not true. There's a lot of value to this land. It's a wonderful piece of land in a great location, and the developers have a plan for a use of this property, which is excellent. And if you add the solar array right next to it, which has now become uh, cost equivalent, you could still generate as much electricity as you'd like to. On the next page, you see several structures. And what we get at with this picture is what is a community-sized turbine? You see a church with a steeple, a water tower, a turbine, a pine tree, and a lighthouse. This is a community-scaled turbine. As you can see in the inset, the industrial turbine is shown uh, next to the uh, Northern Power 100. Here's a picture of uh, uh, smaller turbines like these. This is the same turbine that you have at uh, Country Gardens in Hyannis and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Woods Hole. Uh, the setback for this, if you were to follow the 10 times rotor diameter formula, which is not being applied to this application, would be 689 feet. There are many locations around the Cape in all 15 towns where we could put more community-sized turbines. And I think there was a little bit of a mistake in the applicant's presentation of the regional policy plan. You do have an excellent energy policy. And it talks about distributional use of electricity. But they don't explain what that word means. It really means using the electricity yourself behind the meter. It's distributional. And that's wonderful because it avoids taking as much electricity off the grid. And what your regional policy plan really calls for, the very language that was quoted, unfortunately, they didn't give you the next paragraph. The next paragraph says, and the way we'll do this is that every new development of, of retail or commercial space shall generate 10% of its electricity on site with solar or geothermal or wind. And smaller community scale turbines can help us realize that plan. On the next page, you have acoustical readings. The blue line, which is jagged, is 1,800 feet from wind one in Falmouth. And the green line is a wind chiller on an industrial building at the technology park in Falmouth that was causing a noise disruption. And that was taken 500 feet away. And what you see is that with normal industrial noises that might bother neighbors or might not, it's a rather constant shape to the sounds. Every turbine, if you measure quickly enough at one eighth of a second, you will pick up this EKG-like shape. It has a very distinct signature. It's not difficult to know uh, that a sound is coming from a wind turbine. This is 1,800 feet from wind one. You have many homes 1,800 feet 
from a turbine in this proposal, many homes, and the turbines in this case are 100 feet taller than the turbine in Falmouth. The next colorful page is a study done about wind resources. Remember, I mentioned that we don't have the feasibility study, so we don't know the profile of the wind. There's a study done in 2009 called Wind Resource Assessment and Extreme Shear Events. Extreme Shear Events. If you flip over, you'll come to the third page of this study with some highlighting, and I'd like to read. Figure 7 and 8 show a shear histogram for Cape Cod site, which is a cranberry bog about a mile downwind of an open ocean bay. That's where bog wind was proposing the same size turbines. The wind speed shear at this site is often very extreme at night, with values exceeding 1.0, where the upper blade tip wind speed is three times that of the lower blade tip. From the chart, it is evident that the swept area shear in excess of 2.1 occurs almost 10% of the turbine operational time at the Cape Cod site. This is a comparison of four sites, only one of which is here in Massachusetts. Finally, at the current time, however, Extreme wind shear is thought to contribute to performance degradation and operational downtime. Now, this study wasn't concerned about acoustical impacts. This study was concerned about how well do turbines run. And the concern here is that if you have wind shear, I mean very high winds at the top of the rotor, uh, the rotor diameter circle and lower speeds at the bottom at a ratio of 2 to 1 or 3 to 1, you're going to have operational problems. And we don't know the wind shear for this site. It's not in the file. Here's a diagram on the next page which comes from this article. If you looked at the left-hand side where it says wind speed shear, you'll note that at the bottom of the, uh, the blades or the circle made by the blades, the wind speed is at about 6 meters per second, which would be 13 miles an hour. But up at the top of the circle made by the blades, it's moving at 12 meters a second, which is 26 miles an hour. This is a prescription for the kind of amplitude modulated distressing sound pressures that have been experienced in Mars Hill, Maine, uh, in Vinyl Haven, Maine, in Falmouth, and around the world. I'd like you to skip a couple of pages. Uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to, you to get to a page that has a table in the middle of the, of the page, and I've highlighted the number 37. This is a recent recommendation. It's not a policy yet or regulation. It says residential areas, six meters a second wind, the turbine shouldn't exceed 37 dBA. This actually comes from the very blue ribbon study that was mentioned earlier, the one just released by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection and Public Health Agency. Now if we turn the page, we come to the Atlantic Sound Study for this very project. That was the first study, not the one that was updated later, but the first study. And we see the wind turbine sounds are at 48, 46, 43, and 50. They exceed what might become a Massachusetts regulation. On the next page is the updated study. And at the 7 meter, 6 meter a second wind speed, we see again the turbine is generating 39, 41, 41, 45, 41, 40, and 44. And the applicant knows this. The applicant knows. And if you look at the far right, you see how close we are to the DEP's 10 dB allowance level. We're very close here. And the applicant knows it, which is why they've offered the mitigation measures. But mitigation measures are only useful if a turbine owner will actually turn the turbines down or off when needed to alleviate uh, from the distress of these sound pressures. And to know whether that will really happen, and believe me, turbine owners don't want to turn them down once they're built. We need to know what that capacity factor is. Because if we start out in the low 20s, there's no room to mitigate because it will go into the red very, very quickly. Finally, I have attached every page of the executive summary of the Blue Ribbon Report that was just released by the Department of Public Health and DEP. Because I know that this is on your minds and on the minds of the applicant and everyone in this room. What does this mean that people report that the state has said wind turbines do not have negative health effects. Well, let's read from the executive summary. Flip over until you see yellow highlighting. You'll come to a page, it's ES3. Since the most commonly reported complaint by people living near turbines is sleep disrup disruption, the panel provides a robust review of the relationship between noise, vibration, and annoyance, as well as sleep disturbance from noises and potential impacts from the resulting sleep depression. 
But go back to the beginning of that quote, commonly reported complaint. Why is this a commonly re reported complaint? On the next page, the audible amplitude modulated noise from wind turbines, whooshing, is perceived as to increase the intensity at night and sometimes becomes more of a thumping due to multiple, multiple effects. Stable atmosphere will have larger gradients. Stable atmosphere may refract the sound downwards instead of upwards. The ambient noise near the ground is lower because both because of the stable atmosphere and because human generated noise is often lower at night. If we keep going, I've provided you the entire executive summary so you can read it at your convenience. But if we go to E6, there is limited evidence from epidem epidemiologic studies suggesting an association between noise from wind turbines and sleep disruption. In other words, it is possible that noise from some wind turbines can cause sleep disrupt disruption. A very loud wind turbine could cause disrupted sleep, particularly in vulnerable populations at a certain distance, while a very quiet wind turbine would not likely disrupt even the lightest of sleepers at the same distance. But there is not enough evidence to provide particular sound pressure thresholds at which turbines cause sleep disruption. Further study would provide these levels. This doesn't read as though it's a report that's saying, clean bill of health. You can put any wind turbine on any property regardless of how close the neighbors are. Continuing, whether annoyance from wind turbines leads to sleep issues or stress has not been sufficiently quantified. While not based on evidence of wind turbines, there is evidence that sleep disruption can adversely affect mood, cognitive functioning, and overall sense of health and well-being. There is insufficient evidence that the noise from wind turbines is directly, i.e., independent from an effect on annoyance or sleep causing health problems or disease. A possible coupling mechanism between infrasound and the vestibular system, the outer hair cells in the inner ear, has been proposed but is not yet fully understood or sufficiently explained. Levels of infrasound near wind turbines have been shown to be high enough to be sensed by the outer hair cells. However, evidence does not exist to demonstrate the influence of wind turbine generated infrasound on vestibular mediated effects to the brain. What we know from Dr. Salt, which is one of the studies listed in the biography of the uh, bibliography of the DEP Department of Public Health study, is that the outer hair cells are picking up this low frequency uh, vibration from wind turbines. What we don't know yet is how that's transmitted to the brain or what symptoms that might be causing. If we could go down to the bottom of ES7, we talk about shadow flicker is only present at a distance of less than 1,400 meters from the turbine. Well, that's 5, 4,593 feet. Almost every home in the neighborhood I'm concerned about falls within that distance. On the next page, there is limited scientific evidence of an association between annoyance from prolonged shadow flicker and potential transitory cognitive and physical health effects. Ice throw. In most cases, ice falls within a distance from the turbine equal to the tower height, and in any case, very seldom does the distance exceed twice the total height of the turbine. Do you know that the Borndell Elementary School is closer than twice the total height of the turbine? If you flip over, you get back to the chart I showed you before, where uh, the table where the Blue Ribbon Commission is really saying, here's a standard that's being used elsewhere, 37 dB, and the panel is making this recommendation. The panel recommends that noise limits such as those presented in the table above be included as part of a statewide policy regarding new wind turbine installations. And finally, on the last page, we have the panel recommends an ongoing program of monitoring and evaluating the sounds, evaluating the sounds produced by wind turbines that are installed in the Commonwealth. EIC provides the standard for making noise measurements of wind turbines. In general, more comprehensive assessment of wind turbine noise in populated areas is recommended. These assessments should be done with reference to the broader, ongoing research in wind turbine noise production and its effects, which is taking place internationally. Such assessments would be useful for refining siting guidelines and for developing best practices of a higher category. Closer investigation near homes where outdoor measurements show A and C weighting differences of greater than 15 dB is recommended. Why would the Blue Panel Commission be talking about all of these further studies if they really 
we're saying there is no problem. These homes are located very, very close. Uh, there are 65 studies listed in the bibliography and the reference section of this new health study. Uh, I will just read you a few titles. Adverse health effects produced by large industrial wind turbines. Primer for assessing wind turbine noise. Infrasound and low frequency noise from wind turbines. Prediction and assessment of wind turbine noise. If you those are consistent. Yes, Thank yes you. I will. Uh, those are consistent with the other uh, studies that appear in the bibliography. I will take you back now to close to my letter. And I will actually read a part of my letter that I find to be very important. So I'm now back at the first page. And I'm reading from the sentence that begins, before taking the commission through. Before taking the commission through a set of documents attached to this letter, I would like to comment on the fuller public hearing held by the subcommittee named to hear the more detailed public comments on this application. The subcommittee held four lengthy sessions of public comment, which took well over 12 hours. I attended all of those public hearing sessions. The applicant, NGW, was given a chance to open and close each session and made PowerPoint presentations in the process. The staff, led by regulatory officers Paige Sapiga and Christy Senatori, posted on the Commission's website every document, letter, and email the Commission received during this public hearing process, most of which were posted within a few days of receipt. I am submitting separately a bound copy of the Commission's web page listing all items in the record. The list of the items in this record is 77 pages itself. The subcommittee graciously established a procedure for what it called extended testimony through which any party had the opportunity to request time to make a more formal presentation, including PowerPoint slides. Many members of the public, <laughs> all right, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. At this time, I will uh, turn uh, the proceedings over to Michael uh, for public comment. Uh, as I mentioned before, we will be going to roughly 6 o'clock and then we will uh... go ahead, Michael. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As instructed by the chair, I'm going to start down the list of folks who have signed on up from the general public who would like to speak with regard to this matter. The chair has a, uh, allotted two minutes per individual to speak to the matter. And I will be going down the list. Should anyone else decide that they'd like to speak, I believe we're accepting other sign-ups in the back of the room. And I will start the list. Uh, unless, Mr. Chairman, you wanted to swear in any new individuals. I think we've done that. Go ahead and proceed, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First name on the list is Eric Ingersoll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the Commission. Um, I'm, I'm, I am a family member of the, uh, I'm the son of uh, Jerry Ingersoll, who's one of the developers of this project. And I have, um, uh, and our family has been here on the Cape for uh, four generations, and, and my son is with me here today. Um, but I'm not here representing the developers. I'm here um, because I'm the CEO of a clean energy company in Massachusetts. And so um, I'd like you to take my comments in, in that uh, context. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission, I urge you to support the New Generation Wind Project. Clearly, the Cape Cod Commission should base its considered decision on the most important merits, most important merits and drawbacks of this project. Rejecting this project on the objections that have been raised in the draft decision regarding the project would be a grave mistake and undermine the Commission's credibility and reputation for objectivity. <clears throat> While all energy projects will be unpopular with certain elements of the community, New Generation Wind has strong support among the citizens of Bourne, and 1,500 of them have signed a petition supporting this project. And the permitting, of energy, the permitting of energy projects is not a popularity contest. Objections by the members of the commission or the community must be based on scientific and economic facts. And so far, all of the objections raised do not have this factual basis or have been addressed and mitigated by the project. Furthermore, 
A decision to disallow this project would be in direct conflict with the strongly supportive policies of the Commonwealth towards both renewable energy generation, which has been talked about a lot today, and job creation, which has not been talked about as much. Particularly job creation in the rapidly growing clean tech sector where I have a company. I am the founder and CEO of a Massachusetts-based clean energy company called General Compression, which has created 60 the direct time. 60 direct jobs. Time is up. I'll just read my last sentence. Thank you. If the objections that have been raised to this project were substantial in their implications or incontrovertible in their factual basis, this loss for the future economic development of the Cape might be acceptable. However, the objections raised are neither substantial nor factual, and a wise consideration of the risks and benefits will find that supporting this project has dramatically higher benefits than the risks and losses from stopping it. Thank you. Thank you. The next person to speak is Stephen Clark. He spoke. He spoke. Thank you. We move on then to Gary Davis. He spoke. Oh, that's right. Thank you very much. Then we have uh, Niels Bolger, and he spoke. We had Carl Freeman. He didn't speak. Thank you. Politics is the art of delaying a decision. We need to you to identify to yourself, please. My name is Carl Freeman from Thank Orleans. You. Two minutes. Politics is the art of delaying a decision until it is irrelevant. Having read the draft on the recommendation of denial, it seems that the subcommittee has once again taken the belief that wind is damaging to our communities and without significant merit. A conservative sound study finds there would be no issues with annoyance. There is a specific mechanism to deal with any unforeseen annoyance issues. In the latest state conducted examination of sound annoyance issues, there were listed best practices to deal with the issues. A transmission fluid that has a very low toxicity that was allowed in a solar panel project is now too toxic for a wind installation. Please don't do something to my head and tell me it's raining. It, it may work in the bureaucratic to say, oh, well, they had a different criteria. No, that is absolutely prejudicial. prejudicial. And I think everyone here knows it. The, the subcommittee faults the applicant for not providing a document saying nothing will ever, ever, ever go wrong. The examples denote a glaring prejudice against wind. Wind is the cheapest clean energy. We finally have a clean energy to replace our dependence on the natural gas, oil, and coal of our grid. Our towns and businesses are being cheated of lower energy costs with no pollution. Similar sized turbines have been safely sited in Hull, Portsmouth, hundreds of places on this earth, each with hundreds of residents within a thousand feet with no complaints. It seems clear this committee, subcommittee, has not considered the environment benefit of what pollution will not be created by reducing demand on the grid. In effect, you are saying that even the slightest possible annoyance to neighbors is a greater price to pay than the cases of cancer, new asthma sufferers, more severe cases of asthma, upper respiratory infection, a rise in our health care costs. Most of us were born into this system, and we now have a chance to use this simple effective energy to gain a, gain a greater degree of independence. We cannot, not, we cannot assert a right to pollute but I do assert the right not to have my air, water, and food be f further poisoned. Any issues with wind are 100% solvable. Sound is not an unknown force. We can erect barriers between where the wind turbine is and where the people are. These can be dealt with. Time's up. The pollution, on the other hand, uh, other than was, is affected by the actions here as part of the Cape Cod Commission's responsibility is to consider these impacts. I feel they have been ignored or reduced in importance due to a prejudice against wind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next person on the list, John Reha. Going forward, I'll give you a 10-second note to begin wrap-up. Sure, okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, members of the commission, my name is John Ree. I'm from Bourne, and I uh, fully support the Cape Cod Commission's subcommittee's recommendation not to approve the new generation wind project. I further support opposition to the new ge generation wind project by, uh, as well by the Bourne Board of Selectmen, the Bourne Board of Health, the Bourne Water Department, and most importantly, the residents, voters, which amended the town's earlier outdated wind turbine bylaws precipitated by the proposal new generation wind to construct originally now four 500-foot wind turbines. 
In doing, in doing its review, the New Generation Wind Project, the Cape Cod Commission Subcommittee based much of its decision comparing those benefits and detriments. Ultimately, the subcommittee came up with nine in each category. I have submitted uh, today to all of you, uh, it, I, I turned it in, uh, a copy of all of this, so I'm not going to go through it all, but I broke it down into some new material to uh, move some of those benefits actually into the negative because one of them was con con contributes to renewable energy pool and grid. Just a brief sentence, wind power may emit zero carbon, but industrial wind turbines need up to 90% of their capacity backed up to prevent blackouts, thereby causing actual strain on the grid and normally due to the ramping up of these systems. The second benefit that I outlined in detail is the, le the lessened dependence on fossil fuels. I have no less than a, um, uh, see, I have no less than a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Ivan Giver, Ten and seconds. 16 scientists that will back up under that, under that fact. Uh, and also under benefit number three, Your uh, time is up. economic and stimulus growth. But be sure to read it. Thank you very much. I'm going to call from this point forward two people, the person who is next to speak and then the person on deck behind them, just to help facilitate moving this along quicker for everybody's benefit. The next name is, forgive me if I slaughter the name, Michael Giamo. Not bad, how is it? If you could identify those people, that would be helpful when you are at the podium. And if you would identify yourself for the record. After Attorney Giamo, we have, I believe, Linda Kroc. Cook, sorry, thank you. Okay. That's great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and Commission members, uh, thank, you, thank you. I'm here on behalf of uh, Grazing Fields, Inc. and its principals, Catherine, Kenny Fletcher, and Michael Fletcher and they're urging the commission to uphold the subcommittee and deny the DRI application. Mr. Jamo, would you please identify yourself for the record? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, Michael Jamo, and I'm with the law from Robinson and Cole. Uh, Grazing Fields is particularly concerned about the impacts of Turbine 7, which is the single turbine west of Route 25. The base of this turbine is merely 503 feet from the Grazing Fields farm property line. Grazing Fields is an established, successful equestrian business that occupies a scenic and historically significant agricultural property known as Grazing Fields Farm on Borndale Road in Bourne. It's literally next door to the site of Turbine 7. The Grazing Fields property has been a farm since 1686. The Fletchers brought the 80-acre property in December 1995, and through hard work over 16-plus years, they have created a successful business that employs between 16 and 20 people on a year-round basis. They board and care for up to 65 horses at any given time. Many of these horses are owned by customers who enjoy riding on the scenic Grazing Fields Farm property and the quiet seclusion of nearby trails. Grazing Fields also provides riding lessons for students, and its students compete nationally, and it competes in New England championships and elsewhere. A mainstay of their business is its popular horse shows. During a 12-day period every year during July and August, they conduct a premier horse show that attracts as many as 300 horses from throughout the Northeast. And in addition, they hold eight smaller one-day shows annually. The hundreds of people who each year travel to compete in and observe these horse shows pump an estimated $2 million into the local economy. They stay in local lodgings, they eat at local restaurants, they gas up at local service stations, they patronize local retail establishments and take side trips to local tourist attractions. In addition to the economic benefit of these special events, they contribute significantly to the local economy through their employment payroll and through the people they hire for services and for supplies out of local businesses and, and local service providers. Uh, their benefits to the local economy as well as the Fletcher's personal way of life and peaceful enjoyment of their property are put at substantial risk by the new generation proposal. The proposal does not account for the negative impacts that Turbine 7 will have in particular on Grazing Fields Farm, and the applicant has not offered any meaningful mitigation or contingency proposal for damaging Grazing Fields' business. 
the negative economic impact that the project is certain to have on grazing fields offsets the alleged net local and regional economic benefits from the project. Um, it's particularly important to note that the sound impact studies which the applicant has filed with the commission do not at all address any potential sound impacts at the residences on the farm, including the Fletcher's house, which would be downwind of Turbine 7 by a distance of about 1,595 feet when the wind comes from the northeast quadrant. There are absolutely no sound measurements or projections provided for any location on grazing fields farms. This is a critical om omission. Most of the distance between the turbine and the farm stables and residences is cleared fields, which would have little sound mitigating effect. The complete omission of this data addressing noise impacts on the grazing fields property, which is the closest abutter to any turbine location, is very troubling to grazing fields and the Fletchers. The failure to provide this obviously relevant data suggests that the results would not show New Generations project in a favorable light. And the, and the grazing fields concerns and the Fletcher's concerns extend to both audible sounds and potential impact from low frequency sounds that are inaudible to humans. Horses are sensitive animals that tend to be disturbed by new or unusual sounds, placing themselves and their riders at risk. If horses brought to grazing fields spook or are perceived to be disturbed by noise or other impacts of the turbines when they're there, their owners will seek other places to board and ride. This isn't theoretical, this is a fact. Grazing Fields believes that some customers will also be disturbed by the industrial noise of the turbines and will be unwilling to continue boarding or riding their horses at the farm. In addition, they're concerned for themselves, their family, and their tenants about potentials for sleep disturbance and other effects from the audible and the low-frequency sounds of the turbines. New Generation has not provided any information to quantify the noise effects from Turbine 7 on Grazing Fields Farm, let alone provided any mitigation or offered any contingency plan to address the likely negative impacts of the project on their business and on the farm's residential occupants and employees. How am I doing for time? Okay, great. I'll, I'll sum up. There's a, a concern about shadow flicker and blade movement, which can disturb horses. If horses see blades moving, they could start or spook and, and injure riders, and uh, customers don't want that and may leave. There's concerns about the physical, visual impacts, and I've included in my, uh, in my submission a picture that shows the turbine. And, and the final point I wanted to make was about the zoning. There was a zoning freeze attempted through the filing of a preliminary subdivision plan. To our knowledge and based on information from the Board and Planning Department, no definitive plan has been filed. And as a result, that zoning freeze would not still be in effect. Well, if, if council's saying it was filed, I'll, I'll, de I'll defer to her if, if she has proof of that. But the planner, in fact, said there was no, uh, there was no definitive plan filed. That zoning freeze, uh, according to the planner, they could not meet the current born bylaw. So. Ten seconds. I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. We, uh, again, respectfully urge that uh, you would uh, uphold the subcommittee and deny this DRI application. Thank you very much. And we have... Linda Cook, followed by Daniel Webb. Hi, my name is Linda Cook, and I am a customer of, at Grazing Fields Farm. I keep my, I show my horse there, I ride there, and when I look at this map where Turbine 7 is, the, the big property just below it is Grazing Fields Farm. And just, I find it very disturbing to see it that close to the property. And I speak for, most of the clients at grazing fields that I've talked to, um, and also speak for the horses. They're, they're flight animals. You know, they don't stay and, you know, tough it out. They, they freak out. They run. That's their nature. They're, they, they're flight. And the horse shows that they provide every year bring horses in that aren't going to know what these things are. And it's, it's a huge detriment. And, you know, for you to say that the, det the, the detriments are speculative, in the horse community, it's not speculative. It's real. And I think it's a huge detriment to the horse industry. I know bringing my horse there, I'm nervous. I mean, I'm a customer. I've been a customer there for 10 years. It's one of the most prestigious, reputable barns in, the, in New England. Um, I trailer my horse there a great distance because, because of the reputation. And I, I, I find this very disturbing. And I hope you take that into consideration. Thank you very much. Is, uh, is there a Daniel Webb still here to speak? He left. he left. Then the next on deck is Richard Elric, followed by a what looks like W.W. Locke. And 
he's up. Thank you. Uh, good and afternoon. Be followed by John Lipman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Elric. I'm a resident of Mashpee, and I presently serve as the energy coordinator for the towns of Barnstable and Bourne. Uh, but this afternoon, I'm speaking personally, and the opinions I'm expressing are my own. I think after the testimony you've heard today, particularly from the state, it seems very clear to me that the opinion and the recommendations of the uh, subcommittee must be put aside. Uh, in particular, the arguments uh, that you've heard expressed today by the state representatives with respect to the subcommittee's uh, authority and jurisdiction to consider the issue of need for energy or for renewable energy was, was inappropriate. And I think they also pointed out fairly clearly the inconsistency of the subcommittee's the previous subcommittees and, and the current subcommittee's review of hazardous waste as it uh, relates to uh, solar projects and wind projects. I think it's very clear uh, that an anti-wind bias was expressed in that, and I know uh, the members of the subcommittee acted in good faith and did what they thought was right, but I do think it's, it's fairly clear that the, the rationales and the uh, methodology used for the determin determination was an error uh, and that you need to go back review and reconsider it. Dan Webb did leave, but he wanted me to report uh, that in terms of the capacity factors for turbines in that area, uh, he's getting between 35 percent and 39 percent capacity factor for his turbine, uh, which is located in Falmouth. The other thing he wanted me to report in terms of the issue of hazardous waste and the concerns that have been expressed for the minimal amounts of, uh, of so-called hazardous waste, excluding, of course, the non-hazardous transformer fluid that through the Cape Cod Canal last year flowed 1.6 billion gallons of oil. That's something to be concerned about. Ten seconds. Thank you. Mr. Lipman, I understand you will be reading a letter into our record. Yes. <clears throat> After Mr. Lipman will be Joyce Lorman, if she's still here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. For the record, my name is John Lippman. Um, the staff of uh, Senator John Kerry and uh, Congressman William Keating could not be here. I'm going to read the letter that they just sent this afternoon. Dear Mr. Graham and members of the Commission, we are writing to ask you to give a thorough, fair, and equal consideration to all renewable energy projects coming before the Cape Cod Commission for review. We are strong advocates of domestic renewable energy generation in order to reduce risks to our health and our environment associated with climate change and to strengthen our economy. Cape Cod is fortunate to have one of the Commonwealth's most valuable wind resources and efforts should be made to maximize and enhance the productivity of this important resource. The Commission's regional policy plan reflects this emphasis by requiring that all projects provide 10 percent on-site renewable energy generation or its equivalent. Global climate change and energy security are two of the greatest challenges facing the United States today. America's contributions to global climate change and our dependence endanger our national security, our economy, and our environment. But the global climate crisis is more than an urgent scientific imperative. It is also a tremendous economic opportunity to secure America's leadership in creating a low-carbon global economy and our future prosperity. Again, we ask you to give all renewable energy projects fair and equal consideration when examining their consistency with the minimum performance standards of the regional policy plan. Renewable energy continues to play a vital role in the health of our economy and is essential for the protection of our environment, especially in areas such as Cape Cod. Thank you for your continuing commitment to the protection of Cape Cod's environmental and economic resources. Signed, John F. Kerry, United States Senator, and William Keating, United States Congressman. I will submit a copy for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lipman. I understand we have a response. Mr. Nizwicki? Yes, no. <clears throat> no, it's not a, a response, uh, but through the chair, I just want to take this opportunity at five minutes of six to perhaps pull the members on going beyond six. We have 25 uh, people less left to speak, but uh, a lot of people uh, have showed up tonight, and we seem to be making some progress. So if by a show of hands uh, we could pull the members to those who would want to conclude uh, the proceedings tonight at six and uh, carry it over to the next meeting. Show of hands, please. Well, if, if uh, well, we've been at this for three hours now, there's some concern about quorum. Uh, if we start to lose members, not only to quorum tonight, but quorum at successive meetings, because only people present here and now are going to be able to ultimately vote on this. Uh, so we want to be respectful of, of the members' time uh, going forward. 
there there could be uh, on a motion of the commission uh, a motion to uh, keep the hearing the public hearing open until the next uh, commission meeting in two weeks. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to get a clarification. Uh, if we would go forward with the 25 or so people, uh, does that mean we may be we probably will be continuing anyway? Yeah, if uh, uh, the, the what if we go forward with the 25 uh, people left on the list and we make the, that testimony tonight, then it would be appropriate for the commission to motion to close the public hearing this evening, keep the record open, so that uh, when we meet again in two weeks, the commission itself would start deliberation. Okay, that leads to my final question. The people who have spoken in a continuance, if we get a lot of new people, that's going to mean that there's going to be another 25. Yes. So I feel that if there's 25 people left now and there may be 25 more in the future, going beyond 6 o'clock doesn't make much sense to me. Well, uh, just... Uh, just, just a point of cl clarification on that, Ernie. Uh, if we get through the 25 tonight, we can close the hearing tonight, and then there'll be no opportunity for people uh, to, to give testimony at the next hearing. Let's close it. Mr. Oh, okay. That's, that's what I was asking. Yeah, so that, it's sort of the opposite. They're not going to come going. back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, back to the chair here. Uh, Austin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there an approximate time that we're talking about with 25 people, or some of these represent multiple people? Well, there are 25 people. Hour? To our best uh, guess, there are 25 people left on the list. Some of them may have left, but they'd be two minutes apiece, so it's about 50 minutes. So I, I think we'd probably get through it in an hour. Executive Director, are any of those people of that 25 representing multiple people, which is going to bring it on more, or is this all individuals so. that would uh, not to no. acknowledge? Okay. Joy. Could we show a, a show of hands for the 25 people? <clears throat> Excuse me. Who of you are not going to speak out of the 25 whose comments have already been spoken by somebody else? <clears throat> oh, hold on just a minute before we start uh, polling the populace here. Uh, back to the chair, please. Uh, right now, I think uh, the numbers that we have are kind of kind of accurate. So. Uh, there'll be some that won't speak. There'll be some that uh, may speak a little bit over. But the fact is, we got about an hour. So, and please put your hands down, public. This is not time for public comment or questions. It's time for the, the commission members. Michael, Mr. Chairman, uh, out of respect for my colleagues' time, the staff, and also the many members of the public who have made an effort to be here tonight, if it looks like we only have about an hour's worth of deliberation, out of respect for all of those parties, I request that we go forward and try to wrap up. So at this time, I would ask all those willing to stay and see this through, please uh, indicate by a show of hands. Let's proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Lorman, you have the floor, followed by Jerry O'Brien. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am representing a couple people who have left. They had to leave and didn't realize it was going to run over this long. You have two minutes. I realize that. Um, Joyce Lorman, born Mass. Um, I was interested in identifying some people who are actually living with turbines or in the general close vicinity of turbines. So I've spoken to a number of people who actually either superintendents of school departments, one is Portsmouth, Rhode Island, and one was Hull, Massachusetts, um, who are actually living with the turbines either on school property or very close um, near the property of a number of school systems. The first one is from Lynn Krizik, who's the superintendent from Portsmouth School District in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Um, since my arrival here as superintendent in Portsmouth, there have been a variety of issues brought to my attention. However, wind turbines have never been raised as an issue by any of our parents, students, or administrators. As you know, the wind turbine sits in closest proximity to the high school. In talking to high school staff, they shared that the wind turbine has not adversely affected any aspect of the regular or after-school day. Please be advised that our high school is unconditioned building requiring windows to be open in the fall and spring. Having spent a significant amount of time 
at the high school this year, um, while the wind turbines were in operation, I did not detect any distracting noise. The school district office is approximately 1.7 miles from the high school. We see the turbines at our location, but cannot detect any sound emanating from them. Um, so that was from her, and I will submit all of these letters. Um, in addition, the principal from Hull High School wrote a letter saying, as far as I'm concerned, there are no detriments to having the wind turbines on the property of Hull High School. No student or teacher has ever given me any negative feedback about the turbine. In addition, I contacted um, Professor James Manuel, who is um, the director of the um, wind Energy Research Lab at UMass Amherst. He was also on the Blue Ribbon Committee uh, who just did the report that just came out. Um, I'm going to submit his letter. I, he may have already submitted it. I'm not sure. But he is very concerned about the draft response Ten that seconds. this committee did. Um, he basically has said that he does not see how the detriments have any correlation to the body of the report in any way, shape, or form. That probable detriments were not listed in the body of this report, and therefore he feels that that's a problem with this report. That's Thank time. you. Thank you. If we could have those uh, letters submitted, that would be appreciated. Through the chair, if I may. Uh, Mr. Jerry O'Brien, you are next, followed by David Moriarty. Thank you, Commissioner. In the, in the uh, spirit of brevity, I will read my letter. Please identify yourself Jerry please, for the record. Thank you. Uh, I'll read my letter and then just submit the others to uh, the commission without getting into who they are and what, what they're about. Um, dear Cape Cod Commissioner, I'm writing regarding the proposed new wind generation project in Bourne, Mass. As an alternative fuel company, we are acutely aware of the need for all and any forms of alternative energy to satisfy the needs of local residents, as well as the entire U.S. demand for electricity. We must fairly analyze each and every proposal. Both myself and my business partner, Bill Radigan, are residents of Bourne, as well as having established our business in Bourne. Therefore, we are very aware of the issues of the new generation wind proposal. After thorough review of written material, as well as attending various town meetings where these issues were addressed, we feel the commission should be support supportive of the project. We feel that the new generation team has made every attempt to adjust the proposal to address the issues of the Cape Cod Commission, as well as some neighbors that have been raised. In addition, after reviewing the detriments that the subcommittee has presented, we do not feel that the comments are validly sub supported, especially in light of recent mass DEP DPH report. We ask that the commission review their draft decisions and support the project. Sincerely, Jerry O'Brien, Bill Radigan. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have David Moriarty, followed by Chris Capsambellis. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank the commission for uh, denying this project. I, I know they went through extreme. Please identify yourself for the record. Uh, Dave Moriarty, lifelong resident of Falmouth, Massachusetts. And uh, I just want to commend the commission for doing a fantastic job. I know you had a lot of work ahead of you, and you had a lot of investigating to do. And uh, you came out with the right conclusion, and I support you on that. And I, I'm, I'm so happy. I'm very touched. I was worried at the beginning that you weren't hearing us. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the green energy blues we're all experiencing in Falmouth. We, were, we have the green energy blues. You want to know about green energy, just come to Falmouth. We've got $11 million we can't do anything with. We don't have any money to move these machines. Our, our, we can't sell our homes. Our tax pays is going down. There is absolutely no financial benefit to this at all. This is the biggest scam I've seen since I've been on the planet. And I just want to thank you very much for doing such an excellent job. And by the way, Senate President of Massachusetts, she said, they're too big, they're too close. There's no way in hell you can put these in residential areas. And that was a quote from Tuesday on the national public radio. Okay, so the Senate president is not in favor of these in residential areas. 
I just thought you might want to know that information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Chris Caps embellished, followed by Malcolm McDonald, or Malcolm Donald, rather. Thank you. My name's Chris Caps embellished. I live in Bourne. I've uh, submitted materials for the record that will show uh, the following. The project will not provide any power. The energy that is generated as a result of wind will be supplemented with fossil fuel generated energy to meet the power demand of the time. This will reduce the efficiency of fossil fuel generators and increase the cost and pollution. When you add wind, you have to add expensive standby reserves. There is no benefit to wind. Thank you. Thank you for your comment and your brevity. We have Malcolm Donald followed by Douglas Manter. Malcolm Donald, Falmouth, Massachusetts. Yeah, I would, I'd like to support the uh, Cape Cod Commission's uh, subcommittee's recommendation uh, to deny the uh, project this permit. Um, I, I would like to address the potential adverse health impacts of this project. What I w would like to do is relate uh, the adverse health impacts of Falmouth uh, to the Borden project. In Falmouth, we have 400-foot turbines. In Bourne, they're proposing 500 feet. Bourne, Bourne's, therefore, Bourne's machines will significantly emit higher sound uh, energy levels. Falmouth has uh, wind turbine neighbors uh, who have had um, adverse health effects, including blood, high blood pressure, headaches, depression, and uh, tinnitus. And these impacts are seen out as far as 3,200 feet. Bourne has neighbors who will be uh, within the vicinity of less than 1,000 feet of these larger turbines. I would like to um, just uh, <coughs> uh, relate to you, I'm, sh I'm sure a lot of you have heard uh, Senate President Therese Murray uh, on the WCAI, uh, uh, the point on Tuesday. And I'd like to read this verbatim. I certainly, this is Senator, uh, this is our S Senate President talking. I certainly think we've seen it here in Falmouth. When you put something that close, they shouldn't be. An industrial size windmill should not be close to residential areas. And if you see the new one that's on the highway down in Kingston, that's on a landfill. And it's, and this is her uh, emphasis. 10 seconds. Uh, enormous. And that is only 240 feet. Or if you're coming to the Cape from Plymouth and you go over the bridge, you see the big windmills at Pave Paws. Time. And you say, now, would you want this next to your house? No, it doesn't belong next to your house. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, Douglas Manter, followed by Janice Rolfe. Uh, Douglas Manter, born. I want to reaffirm the decision that the subcommittee reached regarding the detriment a new generation wind turbine project will have to the Harrenpon Wampanoag tribe, and I also want to reaffirm the project's detriment to my free expression of religious beliefs as guaranteed by the First Amendment and as a tribal member by the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. The American Indian Religious Freedom Act is a U.S. federal law based on the First Amendment enacted to preserve and protect my religious freedom and cultural practices as a native Wampanoag. The law extends protection to tribes, tribal members, and Indian allotments requiring all government agencies seeking to promote government policies or goals to eliminate interference with free exercise of native religion and to provide access to sacred sites. In previous correspondence with the Cape Cod Commission, I have explained how the new generation wind turbine project will infringe upon my First Amendment rights, and I clearly describe the manner in which the project will interfere with my religious and cultural practices at sacred sites and at my home, which are located on the Heron Pond Indian Plantation set forth by allotment in the Indian Acts of 1850, titled to the Title shown on a map, Heron Pond Lands Proprietors Allotment, recorded April 6, 1850, by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and referenced on a plan of land in Bourne, Douglas and Lydia Manta recorded May 8, 1989, Barnstable County. I am confident 
All members of the Cape Cod Commission will fully understand their responsibility regarding federal and state policies that will interfere with my Aboriginal rights on Heron Pond lands and sacred sites. Therefore, I am asking the Cape Cod Commission to deny approval of new generation wind turbine project. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker we have on the, my list is Janice Rolfe. She's not here. She's not here. Then we have Liz Argo. Following Liz Argo will be James Lydell. Thank you, Liz. Then we would have Joan Simpson. Hi there, Liz Argo from Orleans. I'm here tonight as a spokesperson for Cape and Islands Wind Information Network, and I'm also going to uh, make a few comments as a member of my church, uh, which is in, located in Brewster. Um, I am quite concerned about the recommendation for all the reasons that have been stipulated here. I've worked with a lot of you, and I have the utmost respect for you. And I think in light of what's come forward since you made the recommendation, the, the subcommittee's recommendation, that uh, it will not be easy for you to accept that recommendation in light of the inconsistencies. Uh, and the fact that, sheer, sheer fact that the, the notion that we don't need this project based on all of the speculative possibilities in the, uh, in the detriments list, it, it just would be unacceptable. So I, I would, uh, I'm speaking to you as a person who's very active in the community, not only for wind, but for water issues, all of the um, environmental and economic issues that the Cape faces. And they're getting very severe, as you all know too well. We need to feel confident in the Cape Cod Commission. And right now, this decision, if it goes forward, will absolutely shake us to our bones about feeling confident in your ability to make the right decision for the Cape's future. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have Joan Simpson, if she is still here. And I appear she may have left. Uh, Jim Potter, and I don't see him in the room anymore. Kim Kohler. We have Kathy Sherman. Following Ms. Sherman will be Kim Gardner. Is Kim Gardner here? Thank you. Kathy Sherman Brewster, and thank you very much. I'm mostly going to send in comments um, in written form, if that's okay with you. But I, I will be talking a, a fair amount about our current understanding of amplitude modulation in our particular climate, which I am sure Bourne will have. And it, so the wind shear is very important because these um, turbines will not be operating under the conditions they're designed for. And that's why the wear and tear, and Dr. Manuel knows it very well. In the past, the wind shear has been looked at only in order to guarantee that there's enough wind up there to drive the hub. And unfortunately, what notice is getting in Falmouth, and even wind one got better performance than expected, considering that they were shut down um, and curtailed some, that's a sign of, of wind shear. And unfortunately, that does produce the amplitude modulation that is very aversive. So it, I would also like to encourage you to not make anything of the DEP, DPH panel. I don't consider it expert, but anyhow, um, precisely be because it, the DEP is just going through it. They announced last week that they're digesting it. They're going to take months of testimony. Um, they didn't go to Falmouth. So the fact that in Europe, most people were only exposed to calculated levels about 10 decibels below what this panel is saying is OK and didn't have health effects, that doesn't mean too much. I'm going to try to succinctly tell you in my report what the European studies were designed for, 
what they showed. Um, but in the remaining time, what I would like to say, really stress, I went to most of the um, hearings, and I think that the subcommittee tried to do a marvelous job Ten with very, very confusing changes in strategy. They bent over backwards with, with fairly biased presentation to not judge aesthetics, to not find anything that it get. I You're do agree that the unknown substances are probably not harmful. Thank you. Next we have Kim Gardner followed by Justin Cefalo. Hi, Kim Gardner from Buzzards Bay. Um, I just would like to speak on community morale and add my name to the 1,500 people on the petition that would support the installation of wind turbines. Um, I'm a neighbor and I live down the street from the proposed project and um, I was really happy to see the mass maritime turbine go up and the turbines that went up on the base, it was thrilling to see them all of a sudden pop up in the horizon. Um, I have two children, 14 and 11, and I'm deeply concerned for them as well as for their children and their children's children. Um, if we continue down the path that we're on, will they have clean air and clean water? Um, we have to start thinking differently, and um, I believe this project is a wonderful start. Um, change is hard, and I know that um, it's hard for people to adapt, uh, but I think they will, and we'll all reap the benefits of cleaner air and a clean environment. Um, um, by the way, uh, students in Bourne take field trips to the Mass Maritime to study their turbine and um, see how it works and see the benefits that it provides, and won't it be wonderful to have one right in their backyard that they can look at up close. Thank you. Thank you. Justin Cefalo will be followed by Sheila Bowen. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Justin Cefalo. I'm from Buzzards Bay. And I wanted to say that I've known and worked for the Ingersoll family on the Bay End Farm for several years. And I can say honestly that they are devoted to the ethic of stewardship that the Cape so needs and the ethic of stewardship that the commission has been charged with. The organic certification there assures that local stream and soil systems remain free of persistent pesticides and excess nitrogen. They've done this at great cost to themselves. They're also working to restore the stream for river run eels and herring and have put much of their land into conservation, showing that they want to keep this land scenic and charging them that they don't is preposterous. When I first spoke at a previous town meeting, I was heckled, and when we were greeting people at the door, a friend of mine was spat at. I feel that this emotional outburst has informed your initial negative judgment more than science and should be perhaps reconsidered. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. We have Sheila Bowen followed by Annette Herbst. Good evening. I'm Sheila Bowen. I'm a resident of Harwich, Massachusetts, and I'm president of Windwise, Mass, um, sorry, Windwise Cape Cod. I'm speaking here as an individual. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at the list of your hearings and your uh, subcommittee deliberations. I believe I was in attendance at just about every event, and I'm standing here today to support the decision of the subcommittee and to also thank you, every member of the commission, for your diligence and your um, respect. Uh, aside from, I'm, I've been a Democrat all of my life, and aside from the pressures that have been borne this evening by various uh, state agencies because of the Duval uh, administration, they can make mistakes. Uh, they really can. And I believe that they were down here for political purposes. And you were, you were brought into being to be apolitical. And that is the wonderful service that you give to the Cape Cod residents. And I thank you for it. Thank you. Uh, Annette Herbst, followed by Donna Griffin. Hi, my name is Annette Herbst. I live in Buzzards Bay. I actually live just up the street from the Ingersolls. So I am a neighbor, and um, as a neighbor, I support this project. 
I am also from Germany, as you can hear with my accent and my name, and um, I'm quite used to wind turbines. They don't scare me. They really don't scare horses in Germany either, something that we've been living with for a long time. I think that you have a super difficult job here because you are really not going to win. Somebody's always going to hate you tonight, and that is the way it is, and I see that. And people get so emotional about this, and my heart bleeds for them. This is really tough, and I think that I understand both sides, and I understand how upset everybody can get about this, but I think what we really need to do is there's no turning back here. We really cannot turn time back and just say, we don't have any problems, we can't, we are not going to do it here, we're not going to do it now. Time is running out on us, and what I'm mostly looking for, we bought 25 acres with the real, I have the intent of keeping that open, because that is what Cape Cod is all about. It's about nature, beauty, and everything else, and I think that keeping that land open is fantastic. And those wind turbines, right neighboring them to them, there will be more wind turbines because Keith Mann is having his project and he will definitely, there will be wind turbines to look at anyway when you come down 25. It's okay. I know that nobody believes it, but people will get used to them. I don't even see the Sagamore ones anymore and I just really, I really think you have it tough, but you do need to look at the real greater good. You're not gonna make everybody happy. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have Donna Griffin. I don't see a Donna Griffin making her way to the podium, so uh, Monica Mann, followed by Keith Mann. Hello, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Monica Mann from Buzzards Bay. I have had the opportunity to review the decision of the Cape Cod subcommittee and uh, have been amazed at just how many compliance standards they had to meet in order to make regulatory standards and was amazed to see that new generation wind was compliant with almost all. But there were three categories of concern that the subcommittee brought forward. And what caused me to be particularly concerned was the inherent inconsistency within each of those three areas. The first of the three was the land use regulation, the bylaw and designation. Turbine number seven was in question, that one, two, and five were acceptable, but seven wasn't. We're just once again hearing the reiteration of Curran Moore, town planner, that in, in her opinion that they are available, um, you know, consistent, and therefore I'm, uh, there's an inherent in inconsistency in, in the interpretation of the subcommittee. The second is the interpretation of the subcommittee on economic development con conclusions. Once again, this is inconsistent with findings both of the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities, November 2011, and is additionally inconsistent with the Supreme Court uh, finding a 34-page ruling that the public benefit of wind outweighs the detriment. Third and finally, the, in, um, the cause of the subcommittee's concern was this issue about the oil. I did a little math. We're talking about 1.5%, that's 32 gallons. If I've done the math right, we're talking about less than the allowable uh, oil used for two households on that enormous tract of property. Anyone who is truly ecologically minded would opt to engineer a responsible practice measure that um, rather than having that entire property developed. And one can only imagine Ten how seconds. much. So in conclusion, please consider that the subcommittee reflects um, emotions rather than science. Please pass this on to the zoning board who can bring their expertise to um, the process and that we can, um, any good decision is not based in emotion. It also includes science, which uh, calls out uh, moving it on into the expertise Time. of that body. Thank you. Keith Mann will be followed by David Mann. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Keith Mann. I live on Head of the Bay Road. Uh, I'm a neighbor to the project. Uh, I'd like to address uh, economic benefit to the development of new generation wind on wind turbines and, and on wind germans in general in Cape Cod. Um, on November 22, 2010, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health issued a 374-page order allowing petition of the National Grid to contract with Cape Wind. In the executive summary of this order, the DPU made a determination that, quote, it is abundantly clear that Cape Wind facility offers significant benefits that are not currently available for any other renewable source. We find these benefits outweighs the cost of the project. 
Subsequently, several groups challenged this decision to the Mass Supreme Judicial Court. The Supreme Court ruled in December 2012 stated within its decision is, quote, in sum, our view of the record indicates that there was clearly sufficient evidence of which the department could raise its conclusion and special benefits of PPA-1 exceed those of other renewable energy sources. And we uphold the department's conclusion that approval of the contract was within the public interest. In both cases, these determinations were justified after much consideration of professional testimony. This sentiment is agreed by many agencies, including, we've heard tonight, uh, Mass Executive Office of Environmental Affairs and Mass Clean Energy Center, because wind is indeed the most cost-effective renewable technology available. Uh, for instance, wind is about, I, I say, half the cost uh, on a per kilowatt installed basis. I've heard uh, people say tonight as much as a fifth of the cost. Uh, this helps justify why our wind resource is the most cost-effective resource in the state. Another consideration for economic benefit is that wind power can reduce electric rates. At one of the hearings at the Cape Cod uh, Commission subcommittee hearings, a professional presentation was made by Source One, a, a credible resource in the energy, energy market. Ten seconds. Uh, I'll skip to the end. Uh, I think we all agree that renewable energy is important for society. The Cape Cod Commission itself has an objective to support renewable energy projects on Cape Cod. The Cape Cod Commission is faced to determine whether or not to approve or responsibly develop four turbine project over 300 acres of land. There are few such opportunities on Cape Cod for such a well-sided project. This decision is an important public policy decision framing what the future holds. The mainstream scientific community agrees Time. that wind development is important for our nation. Uh, I, hope, I hope the committee can support new generation. If we get have a copy of that letter submitted, it might be helpful. <clears throat> I'm David Mann, a resident of Buzzers Bay, 50-year resident. Uh, we have a farm that abuts Ingersoll's, and son Keith, who just spoke to you, has got a permit for four towers on 400 acres of land. It takes 400 acres to, to store enough wind to operate those towers efficiently. That, that land is farmland and woodland. The highway went through the land, took a big, a mile strip of land for the highway. Electric power lines went through the land, go right by the site, perfect place to tie into the electric power lines. And and we've got uh, to need, we needed electricity. Granted, wind won't be 24 hours a day, it's when there's only wind, which is at night, it's off. But it needs to supplement the original power during the day can hold down the, uh, uh, the development of other power plants. So, so I guess that's my idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wasn't able to ask Neil Anderson to prepare. After Neil Anderson will be Tracy Bowman. Thank you very much. Uh, Neil Anderson, I live in Falmouth. Uh, these days, unfortunately, but 1,320 feet from wind one. I'm going to give you first 10 experiences. Uh, no speculation, just facts. I'm going to talk about one thing only, and that is the low frequency pressure pulse generated by the downswing motion of the blades of the turbine. This has nothing to do at all, nothing to do with the pitch control, newer or old blades. This pulse goes everywhere. It seeks out specific locations, topographic locations, getting focused and magnified into low-lying areas. This low-frequency pulse cannot be stopped or mitigated. Instead, it bounces around and resonates off of all surfaces. Walls, windows, earplugs will not stop it. It is everywhere. Again, this unregulated low-frequency pressure pulse is the culprit. Wind 1 has been off now since the beginning of November, except for noise testing. Uh, except for tinnitus and the sensitivity to loud and sudden noises, all of my previous wind turbine-associated negative health effects have disappeared, only reappearing during these times when the turbine is on for testing. Two weeks ago, the turbine was on for 12 hours. Not only did we have a terrible night trying to sleep, but it took us three days to get over the effects of those 12 hours. Renewable energy, I must have heard that phrase 30 times since I've been here. Yes, extremely important. 
but to do so with 500 foot wind turbines close to neighborhoods, this would be disastrous. 10 seconds. If you approve this project, I can guarantee there will be collateral damage. What is the number that is acceptable? Please do not approve this project. Thank you. Thank you, following Mr. Anderson. Tracy Bowman. And following Tracy Bowman will be Glenn Berkowitz. Hello, I'm Tracy Bowman. I'm from Buzzards Bay. I live over on Head of the Bay Road, and I am a neighbor of both of the wind farm people. When the wind farm was going up, my husband and I were like, oh, geez, how should we feel about that? We have a 13-year-old daughter. And we asked her, Dana, what do you think? How do you feel about it? You may live here for the rest of your life. What do you think? Dad, it's a no-brainer. We teach our kids that we need renewable energy. I watch television. I don't watch The Bachelor or American Idol. I mean, I watch real TV, okay, that tells us about the environment. We're in trouble. How am I supposed to tell my daughter later on when everything is in trouble? Oh, you know, we thought about that, but we didn't want that annoyance. Oh, it was really inconvenient. Or, oh my gosh, it was so big. Oh, and that little bit of pollution. I don't use fertilizer on my lawn. Do you? That's way polluting. Are you real particular about how you recycle your trash? Because that's very polluting. OK, that goes into our groundwater. I, I know change is really hard. And this is a big project. And I don't envy any of you because it's a really hard decision. But we are at a place now where things, we have to start looking at things differently. We have to protect ourselves because we're now becoming detrimental to ourselves. And here Ten we seconds. are looked at at the world. And we don't like to be inconvenienced, but we want what we want. And we want our way of life. But what are we willing to do for that? And how are we supposed to stand up and be respected in the world. Time. Thank you. Thank you. We have David Berkowitz. Last on my list is Joanne Dolan. Glenn Berkowitz, Boston. There's an anti-wind corporate-like lobby at war against all wind projects of scale here in the Commonwealth. Here's a few facts that they have failed to mention to you. First. Falmouth's single large wind turbine that has led to some complaints uses outdated technology and techniques no longer in production today. That model deals with heavy winds by spilling excess unwanted wind energy by a process that does create lots of noise compared to the relatively quiet modern technologies manufactured today. It is highly misleading to have argued to you that every wind turbine would have the same negative effects that some experience in Falmouth. Second, the Falmouth turbine neighbors complained about unwanted noise long before the wind turbine was built nearby. Several of the people who speak against wind were themselves plaintiffs in a noise-related lawsuit filed several years back against a local machine shop. They lost that lawsuit. Third, the health, safety, and property value studies that the anti-wind lobby cite are based on prejudiced authors looking at very large wind turbines consisting of dozens, if not hundreds, of wind turbines in one place, not the small-scale project of four turbines proposed here. Rather than being based on sound science, your staff and subcommittee conclusions success, suggest that this anti-wind lobby is winning their, their war. That is unfortunate and simply not supported by objective analysis and consideration. Please conclude that those preliminary findings are arbitrary and capricious. And please approve at least part of this much needed and worthwhile project. And then, Mr. Chairman, I believe there's a Linda Edson who should also be on your speaker's list who wanted to speak. Thank you for your time. I have last on my list now Joanne Dolan, and then I think the chairman will address anyone else who wants to speak. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Joanne Dolan Ingersoll. My, I'm a uh, legal voter as Joanne Dolan, so that's why I gave you that name. I didn't know if that mattered. But I live in Buzzards Bay. In fact, I live in, um, on Bay End Farm with the Ingersolls. I have two children, and my husband is Carl Ingersoll. And we will see one of those turbines, and it's perfectly fine with me. Um, I uh, have two children who attend the Borndale Elementary School and most likely will until fourth grade, through fourth grade. And I do know from casual conversation with teachers that they are looking forward to having this proposed turbine nearby as an educational um, component. And just an FYI, those windows in that school are, are closed permanently. They do not open, just if anyone has a concern about um, noise coming from an open window. Um, but I'm really looking forward to having a chance to just talk about, in spite of me uh, being married into the Ingersolls, I've only lived here five years. I was in New York City before that for about 18 years. So I know what noise is and I know what lights are. I've always lived on busy avenues in not gentrified areas. Um, but as a citizen, I saw this opportunity um, on a, as um, well, I'll start over. As a citizen, I believe it is the responsibility of each individual to do what is possible to make a positive impact on a looming energy and environmental crisis that our country will face should we allow pseudoscience and false statistics and scare tactics to sway public opinion. At the outset of this project, I thought the town of Bourne had the opportunity to stand out as a leader in good citizenship and technological progress and be a model for future developments. Also at this time of economic downturn and social instability, the success of this project demonstrates how knowledgeable and informed individuals can in fact do something that will create jobs and provide clean energy for local consumption. Ten seconds. This entrepreneurial know-how symbolizes what America is all about, individuals and local governments working together Together. We are at a juncture in our society where if we continue to place our future in the hands of unknown entities and the federal government, we or we can or we can do things on the local level with community involvement and the investment. Time's up. Okay. Hopefully to make public good. Thank you. <laughs> at this time, is there anyone else in the audience? The letter, please, that you have, that letter that you have in your hand. Yes, would like to have that entered into record, please. We do? Okay, thank you. We don't need another, thanks. Uh, is there anyone else out there that has not spoken that would like to? Yes, please. Yes, my name is Linda Redson. I'm from Marston's Mills, and I signed something. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to it. I was here early, so um, maybe you couldn't read my Did you get sworn in? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Thank you. Please um, proceed. I'm in the real estate business, and I do a lot of business in the Upper Cape, and I've yet to see any diminished property values from um, any of these small uh, wind turbines as yet. I have two uh, letters I'd like to read in for uh, short letters of a couple of folks who couldn't be here. One of them is uh, John Rosengrim from Orleans. I'm a Cape Cod resident who is very much in favor of clean, renewable energy. When I see a wind turbine on the Cape, I take great pride in the fact that I'm part of a community that strives to respect the demands of generations to come. And quickly, a letter from um, King Mignot in um, Katamit. As a Cape Cod business that has invested heavily in environmental in initiatives, King Mignot Center is absolutely committed to nurturing and developing green energy sources as a key to the preservation and improvement of the Cape's fragile environment. We have been following the new generation wind development with great interest, and we believe that it embodies all the elements of a successful, forward-thinking, responsible community project. I urge you to support this development of new generation's wind power project. It's a win-win scenario that is responsive to the community needs and interests. Over and above the benefit of the clean energy it will produce, success of this project will be an incentive for future investment in clean energy projects by other parties. Killing this project would be a signal to others that wind energy is dead on the Cape and will be a significant deterrent to anyone interested in exploring renewable energy resources in this region for a long time to come. I support this myself and I would like to turn these letters in to someone. Thank you. Uh, anyone else that hasn't spoken yet that would like to speak? Seeing none, I would ask the applicant for closing remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in view of the time, I will keep these closing remarks very brief. 
Uh, I would like to just uh, reiterate uh, one of the points I made earlier, which is our complaint mo protocol and mitigation plan. We respect the fact that there has been a healthy debate around this project, and we know that people close to the project have concerns and that the concerns have been the focus of, uh, many, of many of the points that the subcommittee has made. One of the things that we would ask you to consider very carefully after you close the public record is the fact that, again, my clients intend to be here for a very long time and intend to respond appropriately to the concerns. One of the uh, very critical pieces of our complaint protocol is that if we can't fix whatever issue has uh, engendered a complaint, a substantiated complaint, not just a concern, not just a fear, but something that's really happening after taking sound measurements, we will fix it. And if we can't fix it, the turbine will be shut down until we can. That is a very significant promise on our part, and we have every intention of honoring that promise and be being good corporate citizens. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for your team. Um, now I would ask uh, staff for any closing remarks. Thank you. Staff has nothing further at this time. Thank you. Uh, at this juncture, I move to close the hearing but leave the record open until Thursday, February 9th, 2012 at 4.30 p.m. for the limited purpose of second. receiving written submissions. Now you may second. Second. Very good. Uh, any discussion? Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, so moved. Note that the Cape Cod Commission will hold a public meeting on February 16th, 2012 at 3 p.m. at the First District Courthouse in Barnstable, Mass for the purpose of deliberating on the subcommittee's draft written recommendations. I remind commission members of the importance of their attendance, so ensure we have a quorum for the meeting. At this time, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Peter. Peter. And a second. I just have one request through the chair. Uh, the materials that have been submitted today, will they be sent out to us either scanned or on paper immediately? I don't want to yes. be getting stuff at our next meeting. Thank you. Yes. And uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you.